All right, good morning, everybody. Lots I want to do today. Uh, here's, here's the agenda I've got, the ambitions I've got for our session today. One, I want to talk a little bit more about Rawls' maxi min principle because this is like this is the big deal of Rawls' theory. Um, I mean, the, all the veil of ignorance uh, original position stuff is pretty essential to the theory, but you know where we actually get something substantive to sink our teeth into of what Rawls thinks is going to be the outcome of that process of deciding on principles of social justice. Maxi min principle is the one that gets a lot of attention here, and with good reason. So I want to talk about that more, and I want to talk about it through the lens of ableism, as I was alluding to at the end of class yesterday. And then I want to—I do want to talk about the justice term that Rawls puts in there and use it as an excuse to finally talk about that capabilities theory uh, from Martha Nussbaum. And, and she kind of developed it alongside another um, economist philosopher named M. Yarda Sen. Um, so I want to do those two things. And then I do also want to get started with some Cohen, too. So uh, the Cohen reading is tough. Um, like I said, I, I would have, in a perfect world, I would have loved to have the bandwidth here to, to give you some comments on it to help you through the reading. But it, it's, it's, we, can, we can unpack it in class here. It is challenging, um, and given our, our timing, um, we, I, think, I think I blocked off enough time this, this week that we're going to be able to do a pretty decent substantive treatment of it. Uh, but there's a lot of fun little wrinkles into it. The, the Cohen article actually can be summarized fairly quickly in terms of what it's up to at its essence. Um, but the devil can be in the details here, and there's a lot of there's a lot of good details that he gets into in that article. Uh, I think it's um, Cohen is definitely one of the premier um, sort of modern Marxists, uh, in my opinion. Um, and part of it is the uh, clarity that he brings to the table, um, the rigor with which he uh, approaches in um, a presentation of Marxism. Rather than just like a an ide ideological Kool Aid kind of re rhetoric stuff, he's like very serious about unpacking um, the uh, advantages and disadvantages of Marxism. And the other thing that really sets him apart from other Marxists is just his choice of language, how he explains ideas, what kind of language he's using. He is extremely conversant with the liberal and libertarian traditions, and that really helps. Sometimes, uh, you'll see it, maybe you've read the reading already, right from the get-go, he's trying to basically do some bridge building to get Marxists and capitalists to talk to each other. Um, and he actually concedes a massive premise to the, to the, the libertarian capitalist. Um, so the fact that he is able to understand and be conversant with his opponents really, really helps the case here uh, in terms of just making for productive debate and dialogue. So um, if you like the Cohen reading, I definitely recommend checking him out more. He's, um, if, if, you, if you want to learn about Marxism and see a more modern and, um, I, I would argue, more reasonable, um, like not that Marxism is unreasonable in Marx's words, but just a, a kind of polished up and refined version of the theory. I think Cohen's a good one to go to. So lots of lots of things I'm hoping to get to today. So uh, let let's get going with it. Um, so starting right off the bat, uh, how many people in the chat don't know what ableism is, or have you never heard that term before? I'm kind of curious how. I wish I was in the classroom here. You could just do a poll, but um, how many people this is like an unfamiliar idea? Anyone? Kind of, okay. Okay. Well, maybe it's not going to hurt for me to do a little recap of, of what's going on with this. And then I'll, I'll tie it in with the maxi min principle and you can see the relevance of why, why I want to talk about it. So ableism is it's in the category of other things like uh, other forms of discrimination, of unjust discrimination, which is always good to qualify because discrimination is not inherently bad. Discrimination just means treating things differently. 
and that's something that uh, uh, Rawls is in favor for. You know, he's he's an egalitarian about how everyone's interests matter and have to be taken into account when we're designing principles of social justice. But that doesn't mean that everyone's going to necessarily be treated exactly in the same way. Um, that instead of equality, uh, we're interested in equity. And equity is premised on moral equality, not necessarily equality in treatment. Um, yes, that's right, Hayden. So, so ableism would be um, a form of unjust prejudice that has to do with, um, or unjust discrimination, that has to do with matters of disability or lack of disability. And even um, those terms are somewhat problematic. Um, because it, the term itself can sort of presuppose a set of abilities that are the the sort of natural ones or the normal ones or something like that. Um, the ones that are like, this is a proper functioning human, and someone who deviates from that, who's got maybe some kind of cognitive difference um, or physical difference, is then disabled, right? They lack something. And uh, this isn't necessarily, I mean, as we're, as we're going to see here, um, this is not the full story. It's not necessarily about just the person internally and what's going on with them. It's about the interaction between what's happening with people individually and what's happening with the social system, the system of cooperation and the rules and protocols and systems of how it works. So what ableism is, is, is not necessarily individual prejudice, like people hating disabled people or something like that, but rather that the system of how society works caters to a certain set of abilities. And abilities that don't play into that norm are then uh, disenfranchised or uh, given less opportunities, <clears throat> that they're basically there isn't space carved out in society um, to integrate their participation the way it does for other people. So a really good example of a lot of this stuff's about access, right? So uh, education is not a bad way to think about this. Um, I had a student who, uh, this was a couple of years ago, who um, was uh, uh, in a wheelchair. And the only way, uh, our class was on third floor of our building. So the only way that they could get to class was through the elevator. And I don't know if you know about the R building elevator, but the R building elevator sucks. <laughs> it's broken all the time. Um, it's shut down on a regular basis. That's been my experience in the uh, nine years I've been at Bellevue College. And my student was always like, this is a major issue because if the elevator wasn't operational, they just couldn't come to class. So how we design our buildings, let's say there wasn't even an elevator in the R building or all the access was with stairs, then that makes it inaccessible so the lack of a capacity is not just about what's going on with the individual, but the environment as well. And that's, that's the reason why I'm talking about ableism. Um, like a lot of the isms of discrimination, like racism and sexism, um, this is really much more about the social systems and how the social systems create opportunity or limit opportunity based on, on accommodating or not accommodating people's individual characteristics. Um, so it's not, uh, prejudice can be a form of that, right? It could be uh, a cultural system of expectations for behavior and how people are going to treat each other that ends up having those sorts of impacts. But we can't reduce something like racism to racial animus or sexism to misogyny uh, or ableism to people who, like, are Nazis right? <laughs> or something that, uh, and I'm thinking about the historical Nazis here, um, that are that have some some sort of animus against such people or think that they shouldn't exist or something um, it's it's much more about just the systems so uh, there's a fantastic book that was written a few years back called racism without racists and part of the book is uh, just a ton of actual research into facts of our society and how it works but it also is kind of operating under uh, a little bit of like a thought experiment. Can you imagine a racist society in which nobody hates each other on the basis of race? There's no racial prejudice whatsoever. Everyone is colorblind, but the society is still conferring inappropriate 
asymmetries of advantage and disadvantage um, based around the variable of race. And this seems possible. I think ableism is a really good example because very few people I've encountered, I, like encountering people who actually have any kind of personal animus or negative attitude toward disabled people is very rare. I, I, maybe I can count less than one hand of people I've met personally that I think meet that description. And yet our social system is incredibly biased against them, just in the sense that it's not designed to accommodate them. It's not designed to give them opportunity. And in order for them to be able to have opportunity, they have to, they, they undertake a much larger burden um, to be able to make that stuff work. The things that have to happen in order to make that work are much higher. So <clears throat> this is a good example of what Rawls is talking about with the Maxi Min principle about how we set up the rules of society to uh, give benefit and burden. And there's going to be some advantages sometimes for having asymmetries like you can have efficiency for your economy or your markets. Like, if no one had to put in elevators uh, or create accessibility ramps or something like that, that's less things that you have to do. And there's other things that are going to be like that as well, right? Other, other kinds of scenarios in which the most efficient thing may not mean equal access for everybody or equal opportunity for everybody. To make that happen takes a whole lot of extra work. But if that's going to happen, if some people in society are expected to participate in a system that doesn't give them advantages in that way, then there has to be some kind of offsetting um, consideration about that. And in many cases, it won't be justified, right? Like the, the, there isn't any amount of offsetting uh, advantage that would make up for it or something like that. Like if, if say... Well, okay, I've had some students this quarter writing papers in another direction here for my 101 class, but let's just grant for the sake of argument that you think of education as something really valuable and not valuable in the sense of having a degree to be able to get a better job or something like that, but just education itself, kind of like the, the liberal arts philosophy of education or I'll just own it. It's, this is my theory of education. I'm a, I'm a product of liberal arts and happy to be so. That's why I went to a liberal arts school. I'm like, education is about betterment of life. Um, being a better person, <clears throat> being able to get more uh, out of life, uh, all the things that are valuable in it, I think education really helps with this. Um, personal development, self-actualization, et cetera, et cetera. If it's something that valuable, then for society to tell someone, <clears throat> Sorry, uh, we're not able to give you this opportunity um, because uh, it's inefficient or whatever other justification, right? Some kind of greater good stuff. Um, but here's some offsetting, uh, you know, benefit. So, like, let's say you're one of the people who's going to get disenfranchised by the way the school system works. Imagine the government was like, we're going to pay you to compensate for the fact that you're not able to compete in the job market. You might be like, yeah, that's not adequate <laughs> to make up for the lost opportunity that I've got here, right? the way in which I don't get to participate in this thing that makes my life better. So Rawls is open to the idea of sort of asymmetrical benefits and burdens of how, how we're distributing those in society. But um, it doesn't necessarily, it's not going to work every time or something. And we really have to ask ourselves, is that a... A deal that would be that we'd be willing to make right the system of cooperation has to take into account everybody's position and there are some questions here about uh, how valuable certain things are objectively too to figure out if, if those sort of offsetting um, considerations are adequate or not but you can kind of imagine it like um, we we distribute them evenly and then we play around imaginatively with like, what if there's an increased burden here or an increased advantage here? Something like we start tweaking with that a little bit and creating things in, uh, that are unequal. If that raises the opportunities for meaning and value and quality of life for the people on the bottom, then we're going to be cool with it. That's how the maximin principle works. So it's not always going to be like equal across the board, um, but we're still thinking about everybody's buy-in. This was the idea I brought in yesterday. Um, 
Hayden says schools are no longer allowed to discriminate like that anymore. Uh, yeah, on paper, for sure. In practice, doesn't always work out that way. Um, and there's small things, right? It doesn't have to mean closing the doors entirely or completely not allowing for access, but that increased burdens of access. And a lot of times those become invisible. Um, I mean, all these things could have a, the sort of invisibility of privilege idea going on here, that when the system is normalized, <clears throat> then it's harder to know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, yeah, they still do it a lot, though. Yeah, that's right. Um, when the system is normalized, then it's like people think any deviation from that requires special justification. One of the things that's really interesting about Rawls is he's putting the onus back on the system of like, you can't presuppose that just because this is how things are done, that that's what's normal or that's the baseline that is justified and any deviation from that requires special justification. And that's what you always hear, right? Uh, when people are complaining about socialist programs, they're like, why should I have to pay for this? Right? We've got a fine system going on here. Why do I need to pay extra taxes for to fund this stuff? But what's invisible is how the system is already sort of skewed to their sort of benefit to get for them to get uh, disproportionate advantages or have to deal with disproportionate burdens um, in virtue of how they fit into what the system is catering to. So this kind of lens of how we look at social institutions and the rules for how a society works is what Rawls is playing in. So I, I thought this might help a little bit, the sort of ableism thing might, might be helpful uh, as a, a very similar mindset as what Rawls is thinking about. Right? We have to think about what the system <clears throat> is, who is the system benefiting, who gets that advantage, and is this an equitable way to set it up? Is this really considering everyone? Um, and the interesting thing is about how the Maxi Min thing works. So uh, they're even under Rawls's system of egalitarian equity, there still is a way in which we might find asymmetries um, or inequalities still morally justifiable. But they stand in a, they have a very special burden of proof to become justified. So how's this going for everybody? Is this uh, helping to make this all intelligible and accessible to you? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Any any questions people have about the Maxim in principle? Anything you want to explore about it or or that you're curious about? One, uh, actually, uh, here's another idea that it can be helpful. It definitely comes up in the context with ableism. So when people think about special programs for helping people with disabilities, a lot of times the model looks like charity. Like, oh, man, these people are being so nice, like helping out these disadvantaged people. Right? as if these are part of nat just natural disadvantages. And what's ignored is how the reason why they're disadvantaged is not just because of what's going on with them internally, but how the system is not accommodating them. So it's like every day is a day of unfair, you know, to use Rawls's favorite word here, unfair disadvantage. And then the one moment that actually there's some sort of consideration for their situation, now this is charity, right? This is like someone doing something really nice instead of just the moral minimum, right? And Rawls is trying to be like, yeah, that's the wrong framing for this. Um, I, I think that's a good way to characterize Rawls's thought, um, is this is this is just, when that does happen, that's like the least that society could do to recognize the way in which they're putting these people under systemic disadvantage all the time for the sake of something like increased efficiency. Um, Mark asks, what if the people with less advantages prefer to be disadvantaged? I don't know exactly what you have in mind here, Mark. What what is, what would be the story about why they would prefer this? Or are you just thinking about it in the abstract?
What do you mean by that, uh, Barack? I'm not sure I understand. Pseudo? That mean that's kind of sounds like fake, like not genuine. I'm thinking about pattern principles as Nozick suggests. So the... Okay, I'm still having trouble with that. I'm going to need some help, Mark. Um, so you're talking about people people who would be disadvantaged under premised by a specific proposed system. So the systemic rules are then going to give a disadvantage to someone. But the person is like, I want that disadvantage. I'm not sure. Yeah, but, um, <laughs> I mean, if it's a disadvantage, it means it's kind of going against what they would prefer. Or maybe that, uh, well, this also could go into uh, Nussbaum's um, capabilities theory. It might be that they um, aren't going to, they're, they're not interested in pursuing some kind of opportunity, but that doesn't mean that society doesn't want to get, make it an option for them. Right? Especially if we're talking about things that are going to affect classes of people, which is how most things happen with a system. Like, you're not going to see in the law book something that is a provision just for Tim Lineman, right? <laughs> like that's not going to happen, or, or just for Mark Wu. Um, there, there are going to be rules that are going to uh, act on a class of people or, or a group, a subset of the population. And even if there's a couple individuals in there or some, maybe even the majority of people that aren't interested in taking advantage of that opportunity, like say making education accessible, there's a bunch of people just like don't give a shit about education. Um, for them to still have the opportunity seems like part of the responsibility of the society to make that as like they, they get the freedom to be able to choose whether they're going to take advantage of that or not. Maybe that's uh, addressing what you're wondering about. Um, so Hayden, Hayden says, in my experience, most people with disabilities want to have the same advantages as everyone else. They don't want other people's charity. Exactly right. Yeah. They don't want it to be, uh, that, that makes sense to me too, Hayden. They, they're not looking for just some kind of handout. They're just looking for equity, right? Um, to be uh, treated as like an equal alongside everyone else in society. And what's interesting about Rawls, I think, and this is worth critical thinking, um, is that Rawls's version of that kind of equity does involve a sensitivity to contingent circumstances. Even though under the veil of ignorance we're abstracting away from our knowledge of our particular conditions, our particular contingencies, we still have to be thinking about all the sort of ranges of options of who could be us, right? And to think of... and by doing that, um, it's sort of like we want to have a system that really does treat everyone as on the same level in terms of significance or acknowledgement or integration into that system. Like when uh, that quote I was reading yesterday from Rawls about um, the a, a just social system needs to be able to elicit the reasonable agreement of all the sort of stakeholders in that society. And if it doesn't do that, then it's unjust. Um, okay, and then, uh, Barack, I, I still am not sure what you had in mind there with the pseudo-disabled thing. Um, I don't know if you want to clarify that. People, oh, who fake a disability in order to get benefits. Okay, so the opportunity for abuse is potentially going to be a part of 
what conversations we're having in the original position about what kind of system we want to set up. So if there was a system we wanted to set up that we were like, man, if everyone was a decent person, this would be this system would work great, right? <laughs> if everyone was ethical. That's kind of like Kant's kingdom of ends of like what is the ideal way for society to exist. He thinks the ideal way for society to exist is going to be reflective of what happens when everyone is a moral person, when everyone is following the categorical imperative. But Rawls's version of the original position doesn't have any kind of premises like that, and presumably we'd be really concerned with that. So if there was a, a version that would be like super ideal for looking out for everyone's interests and integrating them together in a way that is equitable, but the system is incredibly open to bad actors coming around and screwing with it, then that probably is not something that is going to elicit the rational buy-in of people in the original position. Protecting against that kind of thing would be something we'd have to factor in. The other question, though, is always, if you want maximum protection against that abuse, who else is being affected by it? And I've had this kind of question every time I've had to design a class. Um, how do I want to run my class? Uh, how are grades going to get determined? And how much am I opening myself up to be abused by bad actors? And in, in my case, <clears throat> with my students, the stakes are fairly low. Um, most of the time, if students don't follow the sort of directives and structure of the class sincerely and game it, you know, game it, they're really just cheating themselves out of their own education. So it's kind of like, uh, but in as much as I have concern for the well-being of my students, I don't want them to cheat themselves out of their own education, maybe I want to protect them from themselves or something like that, um, then I got to be a little clever about this. But then I think about how, well, if I did things this way, what else is getting lost? So the more that I put these little safeguards and protections in against the, with the salience on the bad actors, am I also spoiling opportunities for people that are good actors, who, are, who have goodwill and are doing this sincerely? Um, I can definitely report, maybe you've already picked up on this quarter, that I much rather prefer to appeal to students' natural or authentic motivation for participating in the class rather than a whole lot of arm twisting and artificial mechanisms for doing that. Um, and there's, there's a compromise about it, but I think when you're thinking about those kinds of cases of abuse and setting up social systems, it's always got to be looked at with everyone in mind and not just having the attention on the people who are goodwill, but also not just the attention on the people who have bad will, and what would be the consequences of that. Every Everything kind of has its trade-off, and the question will be, well, under the original position, what would we agree to? But again, uh, before I leave this this part of, of uh, Rawls behind, um, it's worth, again, reiterating that Rawls is not saying that every single decision that takes place in society has to be looked at from the original position. What we want to look at from the original position is what are the guiding principles of social justice and maybe some really basic stuff uh, for setting up the rules of that, that system like a constitution is attempting to do, like a, a government constitution. Like, here are the ground rules. Here's the stuff that doesn't get to get renegotiated or not renegotiated easily. Like, we can change the Constitution if we wanted to, but there's a, a lot of hoops you have to jump through to make that happen. So for all practical purposes, the Constitution is kind of the status quo. How do we want to set up those things is what the original position is mainly for. So it wouldn't be so much about this particular policy, about this particular issue. Now, personally... I think maybe Rawls could go a little bit more robust with this, that maybe more decisions that we make, like maybe when I'm making decisions about my classroom, I should think about it from the original position. Maybe that actually is instructive and helpful. Um, in that case, we're kind of just running Kantian ethics to a large degree. Um, and that's what Kant recommended, is you've got to be, every time you act, you have to be thinking about the reason why you're acting the rules, the maxims that license your behavior, and can they be universalized without contradiction? Imagining all the different possible scenarios that you could find yourself in or that anyone could find themselves in if you're recommending this as a universal rule for proper behavior. Um, so maybe that is appropriate, but at least in terms of how Rawls sets up his theory, you know, the way he describes it, um, all he's trying to do is create a platform from how we can decide about the basic ground rules of our social cooperation. But I, I, it's probably going to color it, right? Like, if I'm thinking that uh, of our 
lives together in society in accordance with something like the maxim in principle, that might affect how I now that I'm in a body and in a particular situation, what I kind of choose to do with what society allows me to do. Um, more on this in a second. Um, okay, so uh, I have still lots of ambitions for the rest of class today, and we'll see how much I can do here. But um, remember the other term that Rawls thinks we're going to agree to under the original position is this justice term, which is basically about trying to give people maximum liberties compatible with similar liberties for others. And Rawls does say that principle one overrides principle two, that the justice term overrides the maxim in principle. Um, I'm not sure he's going to have to say that in every case, especially when we get into this kind of debate between um, libertarian capitalism and Marxism, for example, or socialism, that a lot of what um, some people might say as a limitation on liberty uh, is actually recommended under Rawls' theory. So maybe he can't, maybe that, that's a comment he makes about his own theory that he can't support. But it also might be able to be integrated, and Rawls is completely right, if we think about what that justice term demands in a little different way. And this is where I think Martha Nussbaum and Armyard Sen, their work on human rights is very helpful. So um, they got commissioned, uh, especially, I, I think, I think Sen was a part of that commission too. I know Martha Nussbaum definitely was. I can't remember my history here perfectly, but um, there was a, a UN Council for Developing Nations that was trying to make recommendations for sort of kind of like international norms, not quite international law because the UN doesn't have that kind of authority. Um, but the, the, you know, the UN likes to make statements about things and offer recommendations in the spirit of global goodwill and cooperation, that we're all part of one community on the planet, even though we don't all share one governmental structure or political system. Um, so these are, the, you know, the UN operates the way Kant talks about with the Kingdom of Ends, where it doesn't coerce, but it, it makes rational and moral demand. We make rational and moral demands on each other uh, to kind of assist each other in, in doing justice. And so the um, Committee on Developing Nations from the UN commissioned these philosophers to do work on developing a theory of human rights that could be fruitfully used um, to inform this kind of project. And um, Nussbaum comes up with this thing that she calls the capabilities theory. And I don't know if you've seen the UN Declaration on Human Rights. I, it's good reading. I recommend it. This is the thing. This is the document that um, Nussbaum has her fingerprints on. But there's a, a wide range of things that go into that uh, list of human rights. It's not a very modest list. It's a pretty expansive one. Um, and what Nussbaum is thinking is that if we value liberty and freedom, like this uh, Kantian sort of uh, way of thinking about self-determination and agency and empowerment, then it's not just a matter of our ability to control our own wills in action, but it's also a matter of whether our wills are able to translate into something substantive in the world. So what does it matter if I have freedom of thought and no ability to actually enact my choice, to make my choice happen. So Nussbaum's thinking, when I will in action in accordance with a rational principle I give to myself, I also will for myself to be empowered to execute on that action. So for example, if I will that I should take care of my son, my toddler, I care about him, I value him as an intrinsically valuable being, you know, as an end in himself and not as a means for my ends. Um, but as an end in himself. And so I want to support his development. I want to support his developing um, abilities and capacities to be a self-determining agent and to be free in that Kantian sense, to have that dignity. Um, I also will not just that nice sentiment or my value judgment, but I will for the means for that value judgment to translate into actual action in the world that accomplishes its end. And if I don't have the means to do so, if, if say society doesn't give me the means to do so, then what what does it? How much does it really morally matter that they're like, well, you can decide what you want to do with your own reason all day long. You just are completely disempowered and being able to do anything about it. Kind of like in ableism. 
right? Ableism is society might be saying to like do whatever you want. We're just creating a system in which a lot of the things that you might choose to do are not practically feasible for you to do. So uh, what Nussbaum is saying is that it's the what are the obligations of society in terms of respecting basic liberties? It's about also giving people the resources to have the opportunity to act on those liberties. And she says, it isn't the responsibility of the state or of society to make sure people take the opportunities. What their responsibilities are is to provide them. And that means materially, to give people the circumstances where those choices can actually translate into something real. Um, and so she has everything from access to education to things like access to fine arts, <laughs> like being able to do stuff with art, or to be able to have opportunities for play. That's even in her list of, of basic human rights. All the things that are a part of human flourishing, or doing well, or having good lives, um, there should be the opportunity for that. Not that society, sort of in a paternalistic, big brother state, demands that people do these things. Like, not, it wouldn't be something like compulsory education. Um, but definitely universal access to it. That would be <clears throat> that would be part of the responsibilities of the society. It's like when uh, you know recent political conversations that are happening around free college for for all U.S. citizens. That would be pretty in line with what Nussbaum is talking about. Now, are there going to be students who don't take advantage of that opportunity and don't take the state up on it? Sure, but Nussbaum's thinking it's the obligations of society to make those opportunities available to people. If people don't choose to use them to their own benefit, you know, that's on them. That's no longer on society to ensure the good outcome, but to give people the empowerment to make the choices where that's a real option. So is that making sense to people, what, what uh, Nussbaum's thinking here? What I'm thinking is that if you plug that in, for how we understand human rights and thus the justice term of like maximizing liberties for people, then that's going to fit really neatly into the whole Maxi Min stuff about how we're, we're interested in raising the quality of life for the people who would be at the bottom. Well, how, how can we maximize opportunity for the people who get the worst roll of the dice in society? Questions, comments, anything from chat? I've been doing a lot of lecturing these days in these videos. <laughs> I'd love for there to be some more discussion. I, I definitely use the capabilities theory as a part of my teaching, where I'm like, my job is to give opportunities to students. And when they don't take some opportunities, my job is to give them more opportunities, to try to make as much access possible. But I, you know, you know how I'm operating with you. I'm not twisting your arm. I'm not even threatening you with grades too much here. Um, you know, the grade component of the class is pretty low impact, I'd say. <laughs> um, but my job, I, I'm like, uh, it's helped me stay sane for 10 years to be like, well, my job is to make the opportunity. Like, lead the horse to water, can't make it drink, that kind of thing. Um, but that's my obligation to all of you, is to, to make sure that there are opportunities, and opportunities that have this kind of equitable access to them. Um, Mark says, would benevolent dictatorship be an ethical means to promote a nation to provide greater human rights? Well, benevolent dictatorship means taking away other liberties, right? democratic liberties the liberties of self-government. Um, and that would be a question, right? Um, that by itself is taking away some of the capabilities that um, that uh, Martha Nussbaum's theory is supposed to be protecting. Um, this, is, this is a real question. We were talking about this earlier with um, uh, John Stuart Mill when we were doing the On Liberty thing, and Barack was asking all those questions about... Uh, um, Mill's support for uh, British imperialism and the grounds on which Mill, I, I, did, I did some more research on this, and the story seems to be that Mill started with that sort of position because he thought uh, there needed to be some kind of intervention to protect the moral 
realities of people living in these other societies that weren't playing by rules that were creating those opportunities. They weren't liberal societies. They weren't liberal democracies. Um, and then later in his life, he was like, yeah, colonialism is not the way that that's going to happen or not happen effectively. Um, so that's kind of part of the choice here of like, um, are you going to use some kind of coercive interventionary use of force for the sake of someone else's empowerment? And when and how can that be justified? Sort of like how can we treat children as a means to promote their future autonomy, like eating your vegetables. Yeah, and, and we talked about this a lot with Kant way, way, way back at the beginning of the quarter when we were doing that crash course. Um, we were talking about how for Kant there's this necessary obligation that you cannot violate people's autonomy and interfere with their ability to be self-determining. But when people are acting in ways that are not self-determined, which also happens, right? we're not always fully self-determining agents, um, there does seem to be theoretical room for doing things like staging interventions. And children are a classic example of this for Kant because they have to, they still are developing the ability to be self-determining. And this is maybe something we're always in the process of. Like, I'm an adult right now, I'm 36, 36, and I don't have that perfectly mastered, right? I don't have complete self-determination abilities. So, um, maybe that could be justified but we definitely want to be thinking if is it really doing what it is is intending to do or is it creating more barriers for that self-determination but uh nussbaum's not getting into that right this is about um what what does the state have responsibility to to provide and what it what's and, and this is the state just as a proxy for society it's like all of our responsibilities to be looking out for making these uh, resources available to everyone else who exists in our society out of respect for their personhood like Nussbaum's running a very classic Kantian sort of theory here with this but what she's adding to it is that this isn't just about the control of my own will through reason but being able to enact it out in the world so what we materially owe to each other is really opportunity, not necessarily the actual benefit or like well-being sort of stuff. Any anyone else in the chat have questions about all this raw stuff before we? I've got five minutes left to get into Cohen. Uh, I still want to do that, but um, things have been quiet in the chat. I'm just I want to see if there's other other things people want to discuss here. Cohen speed running. Yes, that's right. I think I gave us through Thursday to do Cohen, so we'll, we'll have some time this week. I can maybe talk about the first idea, which is one of the goofiest ones, or just one right off the bat, like I, I was alluding to the other day in the lecture. Like, I imagine you read the first few paragraphs of Cohen's article, and you're just like, like it's kind of what's what's going on here? What? <laughs> I I must be free to do things I'm forced to do. What? You know, that's a, sort of some surprising claims in there. Anything else about Rawls, though, that people are curious about? Naomi, I saw you you, uh, you were going to type something for a second. Okay. Oh, I need to get out the code word, too. Let me think about that while people are typing. Oh, your phone was on the keyboard. <laughs> um, oh, what should our code word be today? Mm. Man, I've got all these philosophy ideas in my head, and I can't think of a simple thing like a code word. Um... How about, uh, okay, here's here's a, just a fun one, because um, it's happening right now, and I'm, I'm always very excited when this happens. Let's do, uh, code word today is spring training. Spring training. Spring training. And I'm going to, I'll type this in here. I'm a big Chicago Cubs fan. So, baseball's getting started again. No, not the Mariners. 
The Mariners are fine. Different league. That's cool. Okay, so I got a couple minutes left. Uh, no one else is putting anything out in the chat, so I'm going to use the space productively. So, at the very beginning of the Cohen reading, he's talking about freedom. And this is not going to sound totally off the radar, because we've already talked about this idea a little bit, of what is freedom really about. And the way that Marxists talk about freedom, and the way that like libertarian free market capitalists talk about freedom, are completely different. Um, thing, the, the thing that uh, the capitalist is trying to emphasize is the ability to do something, that you're able to do something. So in a free market, the government is not putting, the laws don't put any restrictions on what you're able to do. As long as you've got the means to do it, there aren't any special blocks or rules or regulations or fences on what you're allowed to do with what you have. Right? That's, that's at least how it gets initially cast. Um, and, of course, no form of capitalism is entirely free market, but just as a theoretical ideal here, that's the sort of idea. So then you can imagine a spectrum of more or less restrictions on this. But under free market capitalism, it's like trying to maximize uh, your ability to act, what you're able to do. Under, capitalism, uh, under Marxist uh, com communist analysis, um, freedom is usually understood as uncoerced action. So coercion kind of gets in the way here. Um, you know, under free market capitalism, coercion is the name of the game, right? Like, people sit down at the negotiating table and they're like, well, I would consent to this arrangement. And the other person's like, yeah, I wouldn't consent to that, um, but I'll consent to this. And, you know, the negotiation happens and people can have each other over a barrel, like the example I gave of uh, it's a recession, I've got a factory with jobs and you need jobs. And so I'm like, well, since the demand is so high... Uh, for my jobs, I'll offer really low wages, knowing people will consent and agree to that, just because of how the market forces are going to work out. A Marxist looks at that and is like, this is not freedom. This is slavery. The, the Marxist is really worried about how working class people are held in economic slavery, where they are put in a position where they are forced to sell their labor to the bourgeois, right? to the people who own the means of production, like me owning the factories kind of thing. Um, and that's not freedom. And the capitalist is like, looks like freedom to me. So they're not on the same page here about how to understand freedom. Um, the Marxist is worried about this kind of coercive unfairness, and the capitalist is worried about a government putting restrictions on what people are able to do. Cohen is a Marxist, but... He sides with the capitalists here. He's like, they're right. Their notion of freedom is the right one for us to be playing with. When they talk about freedom, they're right. Freedom is about what you are able to do. And one of the arguments that he offers for this, um, very much kind of keeping it in the corner of his eye, what the Marxists are thinking about, um, classically, um, he says, well, what about a situation in which you are forced to do something, where someone is like coercively manipulating you or blackmailing you or something like that? or in the situation with the like economic coercion. Um, are you free in that situation? And Cohen says, clearly, the answer must be yes. Yes, you are free. Because you can't um, be forced to do something that you're not free to do. Someone can't manipulate you into doing something you can't do. Um, I really love his, and this might seem really counterintuitive, but I think Cohen's got a really simple and clear argument and point to make here. And, and that basic, I mean, I agree with him. I think he's right about this. Uh, I love his scenario where he talks about someone who is, like, uh, say, is being blackmailed to murder someone. They, you know, they, like, let's say one of you kidnapped my child and was like, I'm not going to give you your kid, Tim, unless you kill this person for me. Um, and I'm like, Ah, this is a terrible choice. Like, how am I supposed to choose between my child and killing somebody else, right? Like heavy rain style or something. Spoiler alert. Um, so like when I'm forced into this like terrible decision, um, one way I might try to uh, remove myself from this situation is to render myself no longer free to do the thing that the blackmailer is trying to get me to do. So, for example, uh, you know, Cohen talks about I commit some petty crime and get arrested. Well, now I'm in jail. 
I can't kill anyone now that I'm in jail. I'm not free to commit that murder anymore. And so the blackmailer has no leverage over me anymore. There's no way that they can coerce me into doing something I'm not able to do. So freedom, coercion, premises freedom. That's Cohen's big point here. So the Marxist shouldn't say he thinks. He thinks the Marxist is wrong to say that working, working class people are uh, not in a state of freedom when they're being forced to sell their labor for their livelihood. They are free to do that. They are given freedom. They have the ability to say yes, and they have the ability to say no. And to say that they don't have it is just a kind of fantastical, maybe colorful way of complaining about the injustice of the coercion. Which Cohen is not necessarily, you know, he's going to share that kind of moral concern about things. Um, but he wants to grant this premise to his opponent, that they, they at least have the right idea of freedom. And this whole debate is going to be about sort of capitalism versus communism slash socialism and the value on liberty and freedom. And the reason why Cohen is doing this is that most of the defenses of capitalism come down, the moral defenses of it, come down to how it creates a free society, that it promotes freedom. Uh, and communist and socialist systems violate people's liberty and freedom, like Nozick was complaining about, right? The interference of the, the state with people's private property. So uh, Cohen's going to unpack this a lot more. And I got to let you go because um, we're over time. Sorry about that. Um, you got your code word um, and uh, we're ready to go. We'll do more with Cohen tomorrow. But hopefully um, I was able to make some sense of that whole first part on freedom for you. Um, there's a lot of little details to it, but I, that's the main gist is that uh, Cohen is going to operate under the definition of freedom that he, that you get from the libertarian or free market capitalist. All right. Um, I'll see you later. Have a good day, everyone. Peace.